Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Mark's RC. Thanks for stopping by the channel. Uh, as you can see, I got the bug back out again at the quarry. I went there on Saturday. It was a very warm morning. Uh, got some couple hours of uh, filming in. And so, yeah, take a few minutes to kind of talk about uh, how much time I spent on this thing on the bench last week. It was kind of ridiculous, actually. Um, you heard me ramble on and on about the shocks just not functioning properly, I think, in a couple of past videos. And so uh, what I did was cracked them open again and found that there was a small piece of metal holding in some O-rings. And so I tapped that piece of metal out of there because it was just kind of like permanently set in. Once I got that out of there, I was able to remove one of the two O-rings. I left one in. And, uh, and there was also a small little plastic gasket in there as well. Um, and so both of those two pieces were really keeping that shock piston from moving back and forth freely. Pardon me, check out those, uh, those fresh new tail lights that you see there, glowing nice and red on the rear deck. Not bad. Got those put in on, I don't know what day it was last week, Friday. And as well, if you see around the front of this thing, you'll see that light bucket's got installed too in the factory locations. So anyway, back to the shocks. Once I got that metal piece tapped out of there and I got that O-ring and that small plastic bushing thing, whatever it was, out of there, that left one orange O-ring inside. I reassembled everything and they now flow completely smoothly and freely with no obstruction at all. So um, before I did all of this, I, I trimmed about an inch of the coil shock, coils away from the shocks and uh, that, that let it ride considerably lower, but I was just looking for that freedom of motion. So now I've got probably maybe three eighths of an inch of travel before it bottoms out against the, uh, the bump stop seal on the inside of the shock. But then as you can see right there, you know, it opens up quite a bit, probably an inch, inch and a quarter of travel. Um, these are 100 millimeter shocks, so I'm not exactly sure how much full extension travel they have. It's quite a bit. Um, so anyway, uh, what else did I do? Tire foams. If anybody knows the history on these uh, IROC Super Swampers from Red Cat or know about the foams that are inside of these, you probably are well aware that these were just awful. They were just absolute rocks for foams. Um, if you got them wet uh, and didn't dry them out or whatever, but he's, long story short, they, they, they used memory foam, like, yes, like mattress pad type memory foam. You press on it and it takes 30, 45 seconds a minute to reinflate. Well, um, somewhere along the line, I found a video on YouTube or someone posted, I think, in a message board. I can't recall, but I saw this about a year and a half ago, uh, where you take those foams and you boil them in hot water. And what that does is opens up the uh, cells of the foams and it gets them to work like foams are supposed to. They compress nice and easy and they reinflate nice and easily. And, you know, they just do what they're supposed to do. They just kind of add a little bit of structure inside the tire. So the reason I switched to those was because I was running the half foams in these tires and I liked what it was doing. Incredible traction on sand and soft material and stuff like that. But um, with this being as heavy as what it is, I'm not exactly sure where it is right now. It's probably close to 10 pounds. Um, I was getting a lot of fold and almost total compression on a lot of stuff, especially in the back wheels and climbing and stuff like that. So I decided to switch back to full factory foams after boiling them, and it seems to have worked out really well. Um, what else did I do? You'll see, too, when this thing finally spins around to the front, I got, um, I finally got my RPM front bumper put on and I'm not exactly sure what that was originally for probably some bash rig um, it's kind of nerf like you'll see that it's definitely poking through right there it's kind of a little bit larger tube stock than like what like the rack is and everything but um, I got like this and a rear bumper for like five bucks from a local hobby shop and the bumper mounts not 100% correct but what I ended up doing was just taking the original red cat bumper and trimming everything down but just what was necessary to kind of hide behind that bumper and then i just put two rc four-wheel drive uh, three m3 uh nuts and washers and nuts and, excuse me nuts and, and bolts through to hold that all together like i said you'll see that when it spins around um and what else have i done oh yes i almost completely forgot to mention my uh my awesome uh homemade uh 
You'll see him here in a second. Ah, look at that. I put in, uh, I put in fenders. Inner fenders are in there now. So those are made of foam board, and yes, it's kind of generic. Um, I was gonna do a whole big video on, you know, here's how you make them and stuff and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think, you know, I could probably, you know, a few people would probably pick it up, but basically it's just craft time, folks. <laughs> just kind of use your head about how to, to do something like this. I got lucky and was able to, to run a whole big piece through the whole sweep of the fenders and then run vertical pieces near the shock towers and build a little structure in between those and then have that all get hot glued together and then spray painted black so now i mean you can see a little bit of stuff kind of shining through but you no longer see everything shining through like you do on the front which needs to be done next i still have to come up with a good design to work on that for the front because the cool part about what I did was that the inner fenders actually lift off with the body. They do not stay with the frame. So when I want to work on this thing, I undo the body pins and I lift up and the whole inner fender thing in the rear is part of now the body, which also helped kind of stiffen up the sides of it a little bit too. Uh, kind of dampened a little bit of the noise, not much, but some. Um, and so anyway, hey, yeah, check out that front bumper right there. Uh, got a little bit of mud on it. I, I actually rolled this a couple times, more than just the once that I show um, earlier in the vid. So it, it holds up, it's definitely strong. It's, it's attached right to the factory bumper mount using the factory bumper. It's just, like I said, it's just been trimmed down and, and bolted through. And as well, I got light buckets with uh, grills mounted in the front of that as well. So, you know, the thing's fully lit up. Uh, it's got a bumper on the back. I don't know what to do about the rear. I, I'm really torn about putting a bumper on the back. Um, partially because I, I don't like how the back of this thing looks in general. Just the way with that whole just kind of tail thing kind of sticks out. It doesn't have any structure behind it. It doesn't have any anything there to really just be anything at all. So I'm just not 100% I'm not sure. Right there you can see it. Um, so... I've seen even people just cut that straight off, which is not something I'm going to do. Um, but needless to say, I just don't think I want to try and put a bumper to extend anything further past where that looks right now. Ah, oh, look at that fancy skid plate. Let's take a second to talk about that. That right there is a homemade stuck on there with a uh, shoe goo piece of metal. I think it came from some stud work. Uh, I'm an electrician, so, you know, I pick up random stuff from around job sites that look like maybe sometime in the future I might be able to use that for something somewhere. And so anyway, I had this piece of metal sitting around and... Uh, grabbed some tin snips and I trimmed it down to length and like I said I slapped it right on there with some shoe goo and now instead of having just a flat plastic uh, skid plate on there it's got a piece of metal protecting uh, a little bit more coverage it covers now more of where the motor is exposed and now kind of extends a little bit further back to where the drive shaft is at so um, what else have I done to this thing I really kind of think that covers most of the ground um, ah, there's the roller where I was talking about. I couldn't remember when that was happening. I just knew that it happened. So yeah, you know, the roof rack on this thing has saved it multiple times uh, already. I guarantee that this Lexan would have cracked uh, without a doubt. You can already see on the driver's side, um, that's, that's a spot where just some pressure on a rock um, just driving past something was enough to cause the paint to deform. Um, there's no crack or anything like that there. That's just really where the paint has chipped off on the inside. But like, needless to say, this is a Lexan. It's inevitably going to crack and break at some point in time, just like all Lexans do. So I threw in this hill climb at the very end of it. This is something that it seems like is kind of a nice little proving ground test. Most of my most serious car trucks have done this. Uh, the TF2, the Green Machine, uh, the C44, and now this. So here it is, folks. Thanks so much for watching and uh, like, share, subscribe, do all that fancy stuff. Um, but most importantly, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching this video and we'll see you on the next one.